Hello, this is National Chess Master R. Rats continuing my uh, video series on the correspondence team match played between my video lessons group and Carpa DM. This was played down on board 87. Uh, ratings high, about high 1700 versus low 1800. Our man is Chess USA 39 and he won both games. And let's have a look and see how he did it. This is a pretty interesting game. Uh, the Owens defense. Usually, uh, White plays. Uh, d4 at an early time and generally speaking anytime you have a chance to play e4 and d4 and neither of those pawns can be captured uh, by a pawn or a uh, knight uh, you want to do that uh, you know usually there'll be some prepared analysis but you you should be fine against it uh, white will generally preserve the advantage of the first move uh, black should equalize but you know you, you should be fine okay so now here I'm going to get critical because I see this so many times in in games that I'm that I play uh, that I play over. I have see so many people move their rook pawns up, and White's going to move the other one up here in a few moves. Uh, pe people do this because they don't like two things: a knight or a bishop landing on what we call the knight five square, king knight five, queen knight five. That's the old archaic English descriptive notation. Uh, all, that's what I grew up with. All the old, uh, classical chess books are in English are written in it. Uh, it better it, it, than algebraic in respect that it describes a square better. If I say knight five, uh, I'm talking, because you recorded from either side's perspective, I'm talking about those squares. Uh, come on, light up this. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Boy, this thing is low, slow sometimes, lighting up squares. Uh, the reason people do this is they don't like pins, they don't like nice threatening forks. And, you know, when we're beginners, we run into that. We run into, uh, especially forks on on the uh, bishop seven squares, okay? Or uh, whatever, we just don't like it. And the problem with these moves is two things. Well, it's more than two, but the, the main problem is first you're spending a tempo when you could be developing a piece, okay? Next thing is uh, you're weakening your pawn structure. Uh, I, I had one game where uh, a, where one of my students had played a, a pawn to king rook three, at weakening his structure. White wasn't even trying to get to, to knight five, but he played it just to keep white out of there. And about 20 moves later, all of a sudden white had this winning sacrifice, bishop taking this pawn. <laughs> and uh, if black took, he was going to get mated. If he didn't take, he was just going to be down a pawn. Or I think the bishop was going to sacrifice again on g7. And had the pawn been sitting there, uh, bishop to h6 didn't mean anything. You can just slip right on by with g6, and there was there was no rook to capture on f8. So, you know, it, it, it weakens your structure. It provides possible sacrifices. It doesn't develop a piece. Uh, it, it, it just bad moves. Okay. Now, in some respects, in an Owens defense, Black does play bishop b4, but you see, there's a big difference here. In this in this setup, White hasn't played d4, so there's no pin. Okay, so uh, Black may not even want to play Bishop b4 in this position. If if uh, let's see, let's find another move. Uh, let's find another logical move for White. Uh, White's going to go on and play d3. Okay, it's, it, we'll talk about that when he plays it. Uh, White's going to go on and play d3, but you know, you just meet bishop b4 with bishop d2, and you've you've developed another piece, okay, if you don't like the pin, uh, and you don't have to waste a time, tempo with a3, okay, and that way you've got all the closer to getting your pieces developed, because uh, no matter how you slice it, when you play a3, you're one move behind in getting your pieces developed, and you can't show me otherwise, because this, because this is the truth, um, you know, we can sit here and analyze, and, and show them, how quick pieces they can get their their pieces developed and count the tempos who's ahead and half tempo ahead or whatever and a3 just doesn't help white at all okay and a rant okay so a3 uh, black develops now I would have play if you're gonna play a3 d4 was more thematic okay d4 makes sense here if you're gonna play a3 so you know a3 isn't that bad but it belongs with the pawn going to d4 okay because now black does not have bishop b4. And now you've got an active diagonal for the bishop. Now you may not want to put it on b on c4. Right now you might want to put it on e2. But you never know. It may want to go to c4 later. Okay. So uh, d4 was the appropriate move. Well, not yet. This is hanging. Eh, 
I miss one movers. That's what's fun about my videos, okay? Uh, let's back it up a little ever so slightly. Let's go ahead and play d4 here. Now we're going to play bishop b4. Well, whoop de doo We're threatening to take this pawn. Hey, guess what? I can cover that pawn. I'll develop a piece. Now, do I care about double pawns if I'm white? Nope, not at all. Okay, I'm going to pressure that pawn again. Here I come. Okay, well, I'm just going to put my queen right here. And I've neutralized the, uh, the threat on e4. So, see here, by playing, uh, instead of playing a3, white would have a much better position, in my opinion. Just allow this pin. This pin isn't going to beat you, okay? You can cover uh, what, what, what uh, black is trying to do. So, regardless, a3 got played, uh, knight f6, and you can't play d4, I apologize, you have to play d3 here. Uh, but look at the difference. Uh, the pawn's not on d4, this diagonal is closed, this bishop is not developed, where uh, the queen isn't could have been, been uh, coming up to e2. Big difference in white's game as, to, as opposed to... Uh, uh, you know what could have been okay so black black uh, plays d6 now the interesting thing is even though white's not playing that well uh, with his formation not that aggressive black can't really do much against it uh, I guess that could be frustrating if you're trying to get an advantage when someone's playing timidly but just develop your pieces and all will be well uh, I would opt Maybe more, I might think about going into a close Sicilian type position. Play c5. Uh, this stakes a square, uh, a share, uh, a stake on the square uh, uh, d4. And uh, you know, back it up with knight c6. Uh, and then maybe at the right time, once black is developed, he can think about whoop, breaking with uh, d5 also. Uh, you know, just a potential, potential plan. But d6 is a quiet move and neither side is going to really get much here and I would opt more for bishop e7 and getting castled but okay now comes b4 now uh, this doesn't help the development either what's what's white trying to do uh, but now black opts to play c5 I think he should have done it last move like it like I was you know the point I was saying uh, but Black doesn't have to play c5 now. He can prepare it. Let's develop first and then do our then do our pawn break. Okay? I think this is a good sound. It's a good sound strategy to get your pieces developed first. Then you can get an idea of what kind, where you want to uh, go next. So I think c5 is just a little premature, but it it's perfectly playable. And and here comes the other move I'm talking about, uh, the other rook pawn move. Now what is what is White doing here? <laughs> Uh, this these moves just don't help. Uh, White could have castled. Uh, White's always going to be a tempo down because he didn't castle here. Black wasn't planning to put a knight there. That's the only thing that can go there. This bishop can't. Is White trying to put put his uh, bishop here and doesn't want to get kicked? Well, is that the best square? Well, how about a pin? How about a pin of your own? How about uh, just castle and figure out where you want to put the the uh, the bishop later? You know these rook pawn moves are just bad. Anyway, uh, black now in, uh, uh, goes for an exchange. And again, I think development should come first. And now comes the break that I'd suggested at one point once black was developed. See, black's not completely developed yet. So this, in a way, is, little, is still a little premature. And you, you, it's really interesting what's going to happen here. Uh, I'll try to explain this. I think you'll all find this very useful. What happens now is two minor pieces get traded off very quickly. Now, let's let's just have some fun here. I'm going to go back to the original position. We know this is the, the, the hardest position in the world to solve, white to play and try to win, right? Well, it can't be done. you got to have mistakes. But let's just, for the fun of it, let's, uh, let's pit ourselves against a... Uh, Let's take white here and say we're playing against a much stronger player. But let's remove all the pieces except for the kings and the pawns. Okay? Uh, there's a good chance you're not going to lose this game. Why? Because it's pretty even. And uh, and without making a really bad move, 
although it's possible in a king and pawn ending, without playing a really bad move, you have a great chance to hold the draw. Why? Because there's so few pieces on the board. Or give each other, give each other, or uh, take everything off in a king and a bishop of the same color. Make an opposite color. The point I'm getting at is that it, with, when there are fewer pieces on the board, it's harder to do something. Now, it doesn't mean it can't be done. It's, it's done every day when someone wins a game after several exchanges are made. But the point, the simple point I'm trying to make is that when you trade pieces off in a, in a relatively level and harmless game, uh, you reduce the winning chances. So my logic, let's come back to where we're at uh, after D5. Where is it? Here's the D5 break. Okay. Uh, my logic, I don't like to trade pieces if I don't have to. Now, it doesn't mean I will ignore every exchange in the book that comes along. Uh, sometimes it's good to make an exchange. Like if you can get rid of your bad bishop, like for instance, if this is White's bad bishop, if White had an opportunity to trade that bishop, uh, he should. Well, it's not. you can't see how he's going to trade it, but I'm just kind of making a point. That's a piece that White should think to trade because it's, it's hemmed in by, behind a bunch of pawns and has no activity. But... For the most part, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm of the logic that I don't want to trade pieces, and this is what I want you folks to uh, learn from me. You want to develop the confidence that you can do more with your pieces than your opponent can do with his. Therefore, you'll keep them on the board. Okay, let's watch them come off. Okay. And here they come. Now check. And just like that, Two minor pieces have come off the board very quickly. And we now have uh, a very interesting material imbalance or positional imbalance on the board right, based on pawn structure. Uh, black has an outside pass pawn. White has two hanging pawns in the center. Uh, but there's one thing missing here. Development. Black is not castled. White is not castled. So you see, this conflict came just a little bit too early in my book. And therefore, the winning chances are diminished. It's hard to play this position for a win with white or black. Now, if I have this position as white or black against somebody that I'm rated 100 points uh, better than, is in, pretty much in this case, okay, I like my chances. But I don't like my chances as much as I would have back at move... Uh, uh, five if I'd played c5 okay I don't like my chances as much this is a pretty level game uh, let's see how it plays out now they both get castled okay good and a5 good and bad good this pawn's not going to run down down on its own okay but with or unmolested it's going to be challenged so it's good that it's closer to the queening square. It is a pass pawn. You do need to move it. The bad is it weakens a square here. But it turns out this doesn't really matter much. Uh, so we'll say that it's a good move. Uh, it, and it certainly, if Black's going to try to play for a win, he's going to have to get that uh, that pawn rolling. So you might as well do it. Because there's not much else going on. Okay. White counters. Black backs up. Now, here we have... The, the, the traditional hanging pawns in their ideal spot. They're hanging because they can't be protected by another pawn. They must be protected by pieces, and right now they are. But also, conversely, black is not attacking either one of them. Uh, but they also control a great deal of space. Uh, see, each, well, come on, color all four of those. Thank you. Well, two, to go, two to go. Let's go back and forth. Come on, be a good boy. There he goes. Black's, white's controlling a lot of squares. So uh, the game is still relatively uh, relatively even and black comes up the interesting way to generate some activity here uh, now for instance if uh, if pawn takes black can get away with knight takes because the queen is loose okay now uh, white can't play knight takes knight he loses his queen and if he plays uh, rook takes uh, let's, I'm sorry, queen take. Let's see what happens here. Queen takes. Uh, eh, it's getting a little tricky here. I was, let's see this. Now the bishop's loose. You're dropping a bishop. This didn't work right. Let me see. I get. I looked at this earlier. And let's see what he did play. He played d5. He he didn't take it. But could he take this pawn? 
Okay. No, he can't take it with the knight. That's obvious. Okay. He can't take it with the knight because of the pin. Can he take it with a pawn? All right. Now, let's see. Uh... You can't play knight takes because of the reasons I just showed. But you can pile up on it uh, with rook e8. And I don't know, you know, maybe white can generate some counterplay, you know. Go back to this b6 weakness. The knight is kind of overworked. It's, it's protecting this and trying to regain this pawn. Maybe white can generate some play against b6. Uh, I, you know, I don't think it's enough. I think it was better for White to take this pawn is what I'm getting at rather than what he did. Uh, let's see. Watch watch this. Knight takes. Uh, okay, we've got to take the queen first. Queen takes. Now, you don't want to play knight takes check. Okay. Rook takes. Now, knight takes. Rook takes. Now, there's a pin on e2, but that should be okay. Rook takes b6, looking pretty level. Okay, now there's a threat on b7. Uh, if it would clearly go down to an easy draw for a cure, rook takes, rook takes, rook takes, rook takes. That should that should easily be a draw. Uh, because I don't think White has enough to play for a win here. But so e5, e5 is an interesting move. It it invites uh, White to do exactly what he did. Uh, trying to maybe White's playing for a win, but I, I don't think d5 is a good move because it's you know the hanging the hanging pawns we're gonna get we're gonna get destroyed, but but now Black gets this wonderful square for a knight which he's gonna be I think he's gonna use, but not just yet. But bang f6 secures in this pawn on e5 and suddenly White's kind of stymied and now these hanging pawns uh, could become targets. Uh, looks like. Uh, Black is able to start mustering up uh, play against them, and uh, White's not doing anything yet against uh, b6. So let's go forward, and now the knight occupies c5, and now Black undermines. And here I think uh, Black should have taken on b5, just just made the trade, and the game will get get very very level. Uh, in a hurry because there's not really much going on here but all of a sudden uh, what's going to happen here is black gets two gets two connected pass pawns now both sides have two connected pass pawns but with one on the fifth rank but you know who's are more dangerous blacks why because black is behind his pawns and in, in supporting their push he's ready to play a4 the pawns well protected a3 uh, or b3 first, uh, you know, those pawns are getting dangerous. So suddenly black's getting some play here. And white tries to counterattack because black has left his king vacant. Everything, just about everything black owns is on the queen side. And here comes here comes the, uh, the critical move of the game. And this is what makes correspondence chess so uh, wonderful. It's when you actually take, sit down and take the time to work out the lines. And white, what white plays here is bishop d1, and I have no idea how long he took on the move. But I hope he at least consider what I'm going to show you. And what's kind of remarkable about it, remarkable about, remarkable about what I'm going to show you, is it's very easy to analyze. Because once the, uh, uh, the pendulum starts swinging, every move uh, pretty much is forced. So when you find a continuation where your opponent only has one good move, uh, these are easy positions to analyze because you know and you can make note that every move works. Black has, or white has this very interesting sacrifice. Uh, white needs to, black has to accept it. He can't park the king uh, over here. He just can't. He's going to run into trouble. Uh, this, this king position is too weak. If anything, just bring uh, bring the bishop back to f5, and and you're threatening a knight check followed by a queen penetration. I mean, there's so many good things to do here, so you pretty much have to take. Now comes this check. Now there's two legal moves. The problem with uh, king h8 is 
white has this wonderful rook, rook uh, move. Now it's threatening threatening a check here, and that rook is penetrating, and white's in big or black's in big trouble here. So you have to come back here. Now this isn't as effective, uh, but this move is knight f5. Now this threatens a mate that black has to stop and deal with. Now rook e f7 fails to knight h6 check. So this is forced. That's the only move. Now comes d6. And you can't, you have to stake protecting the, uh, the mate. You can't put the queen on f7 because that knight h6 check. So you have to go here. Now comes this check. And you can't bring the king here because this is mate. So black must give up the queen. Now, white sacrificed two pieces. Let's put the rook here for the fun of it. Uh, white has sacrificed two pieces but won the queen. And look look at the resulting position. This is, this is what's fascinating. This is uh, where postal chess, correspondence chess, really gets interesting. How to evaluate this? Wow. Well, if black can set up a blockade on those pawns, he's going to... And, and and win one of them, he's probably going to win the game. If white, I mean, if white can do that, if white can blockade those pawns, do you want to risk this? You know, this is this is the kind of position you want to spend a couple hours looking at because you'll learn so much about chess, uh, trying to figure out what will happen here. Uh, is black better? I don't know. Queen G3. Just get. Get the queen over here. Try to get the queen over here so you can blockade those pawns. Okay, let's try a3. I mean, we're just analyzing. We don't know if these, these are the best moves or not. I'm not worried about this pawn on e7. It's not going anywhere. I want to run my pawns. Okay, now I'm going to play queen c3. Blockade. Okay, now, I, there's all kinds of interesting candidate moves. There's knight a4. No, that's no good. You'll drop the pawn on b3. Uh... If I play a2, it looks like maybe maybe the pawns got blockaded. Maybe, well, no, you can't sack on b3 because you're ready to queen. So, rook a1. Uh, now, how does how does black play for a win here? Well, you're going to have to activate the rooks. That means you're going to have to stop and take this pawn at some point, but that gives white time to, uh, or black, yeah, white time to try to, wiggle his way out of this. Um, I don't know, rook e2. Try to stop this move. Now let's put the rook here so that it's threatened to come come down down the position. Uh, now queen b queen b4. Okay. Attacking the knight. Maybe you have to stop and play rook c7. And what's happening here? I don't know. Uh, but if you, you know, the beauty of correspondence chess is you have hours to sit here and look at a game rather than the five or six minutes I've taken. And uh, if you're playing for win, you know, you have a queen against two minor pieces. Your opponent has a couple of pawns. Uh, if black doesn't play this accurately and those pawns vanish, uh, white wins. So if anything, just to make it fun, it would have been worth trying. But now the game just goes, but the game, as it turns out, it goes rapidly downhill for white. So this was his best chance. Okay, bishop bishop went here, and now bishop a6. Now comes the mate threat anyway, but black has new defenses that he didn't have before. Here's one of them. Rook a7, and now the bishop decides to come back, try to liquidate the knight. Here comes the check. And now... Uh, Black sacrifices on e7, but not with his queen. With the rook, he gets to keep his queen now. So uh, now it's just an exchange sack, and and Black still has the luxury of his queen. He doesn't need the extra rook. He's got the queen. And those pawns are getting ready to run. And here they go. Okay, and Black, Black, White's not poised to blockade him. There goes another pawn. These pawns are just uh, driving poor white batty. Okay, queen a5. And white creates some interesting play here, but it's just going to always run out of gas. There's no back rank mate. Both uh, d8 and a8 are covered. Uh, creates a little air. 
and clean F5 check, but white's running out of checks. And those pawns are really, really, really dangerous. White hasn't done anything to try to blockade him as compared to the line I gave. Okay, now, uh, interesting move. Can't take the rook because he's wishing to have gone E1 with check. So he tucks the queen away, or king away. Here comes the check. Now swaps. And look at those pawns. They're about ready to go. And if white trades, uh, those pawns are unstoppable. So he grabs the knight, but the, both pawns are on the 7th rank, and game over. Game, set, match. Uh, and after g6, white resigned. He's going to have to uh, be a queen down here pretty quick. So, very interesting game, and, and I hope you enjoyed it. Let's look at their other game. Uh, and we'll flip the board. Why does... I don't know why it always starts. That doesn't start out on move one. I don't know why that happens. Maybe version three will get rid of it. I think I already said that. Okay, white plays the London system in the queen pawn opening. Um, usually leads to very level games. H3 is played to, to, to tuck the bishop back to H2. Uh, pretty level game. Not much is happening. I don't know. Black didn't need to weaken himself with G6, but... Uh, now, interesting to take with the pawn. This gives white access to the d4 square and a little bit of leverage on f6. And not much is really happening yet, but let's just stop and, stop and take stock. I know I'm kind of going through this kind of quick. Uh, White's obviously trying for a kingside attack. He's got a lot of pieces over there. Uh, the only thing not directly threatening to menace the queen side are the, is the queen rook on a1. Uh, the, the rook on f1 is ready to go because white's going to play for an f5 break here. Uh, black doesn't have too much defending it. His queen bishop and queen rook are on the other side of the board. So white's effectively ahead some material on the king side. But where's, where's black's play on the queen side? Well, black has one plan here, and it's slow. That's to advance this pawn to b4 and then try to use the b file. But it's slow because it's two moves to just get the pawn there. It's another move to get a rook on the b file, and it's another move to get the bishop off the b file. So uh, that's what black should try for and just see what happens. But instead, he weakens his king side a little further, and that's not good. And queen c5 doesn't help the... Uh, uh, the b5 break. It does attack a pawn, but that's dealt with easily enough. White just activates his knight, uh, clears the f-file. So now black is playing defense instead of getting his own play going. So the plan that I was su suggesting for black is still as far away as it was when I first mentioned it. And now a6 makes no sense. Uh, it makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, what are you trying, you know, it's back to these rook pawn moves. You know, he moved a rook pawn in the other game. Now he's doing it here. White's not trying to put anything on b5. Uh, and you can put a pawn on b5 uh, as it stands. So a6 is just says, here, white, have an extra move. And, you know, even though I say the plan that black has is, is uh, it was four moves just to get the, uh, uh, rook on the B file and the pawn to B4 before you're ready to start doing anything there. White gets four moves too. And so far, White's been uh, shifting pieces around on the king side, getting him better posted so that he can do his attack. And here comes the next step. And uh, let's get rid of your dark squared bishop now and reduce your defenses. And suddenly, black is left with... Uh, Facing an attack, and he, he's hopefully trying to defend it, but there's just not enough there. This white crashes through. Now you're threatening to win a piece uh, on on g7. So he chases the queen out. Uh, might have been better to go back to g3, but because it gets tempo, but in turn that weakens the g6 square, so it works out. Uh, nice swish and zug. Uh, and now rook takes and black can't afford to take on 
on uh, h6. He's, there's a very powerful rook takes g6 check uh, coming. Okay. Now here, I think uh, knight takes f7 just brings down the curtain. Uh, it undermines the defense of of, uh, of g6. But rook takes works also. And I think black needed to take this knight and white's still for choice here. He'll just double rooks or and everything will be fine. But uh, the king went back and now white just picks up an exchange and now that left a bishop loose and the game's going to end abruptly. Now finally, finally, at move 32, Black gets ready to do his break that I was calling for way back when. Unfortunately, uh, too, it's too late. Uh, White it will administer a checkmate. Now it's a forced mate. So there you have it. Not as much attention on this game as the other. Uh, you could tell Black's a decent player. Oops. You could tell Black's a decent player, but he just didn't uh, uh, get things going the, 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 the two chances he got. Uh, the bishop takes uh, h2 check in the first, or h7 check in the first game, and then not playing b4. So let's go back just for the fun of it and wrap this up. Where was I suggesting uh, b5? Uh, let's see. Let's put the knight, let's see, where was it? Knight e5. It was before here. Let's 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 leave it here and try it. Let's try b5 right now. Okay. Or no, I think it was after the queen got to c5. Yeah, let's just do it back here. Let's do it from when I was starting to do it. Let me find the spot here. B5. Okay, now we'll have White do similar stuff as to what he was doing in the game. Uh I'll put the knight here and bother the pawn. Okay, I'm going to come up. Now, let's see. What was white doing on the king side? Uh, let's go ahead and put this rook over here as he did. Now, let's put the rook here. Now, for the fun of it, we're going to double rooks. And I tuck this bishop back here so it's out of the way. Now I've got my rooks doubled. And again, you know, this is just... We're just seeing what can happen. You know, not these aren't force moves by any means, but black's getting some activity. Uh, is white ready for f5? Maybe not. Let's, let's put the queen here. Take, take. Now we've got this open file, although the... Uh, bishop is guarded. You know, hey, maybe we can get away with taking a pawn. Let's go ahead and take it. White ignores it. And I'm going to double, get my rooks doubled on the 7th rank and see what I can come up with. Well, that might be a mistake. E6 is loose. But, you know, like I say, I, I'm just kind of demonstrating. But uh, a move sequence black should consider and every move that white makes, black has to stop and consider if this is their correct plan. But at least black had a plan. You know, I found a plan for black. It may or may not work. Um, but you need to find a plan and adhere to it. Then the stronger your opponent, the more likely uh, uh, he's going to find a flaw in your plan or, or improve his. Now somebody's calling me. I got to go. Thanks.